ده شابتر تو الكتاب احنا برضو بناخد العناوين دي وبنصنف في الديتيلز وبنعمل لها اكسبانشن من عندنا والشغل بتاعكم والمجهود بتاعكم هنا كان حلو قوي الاهداف بتاعت الشابتر دوت كانت ان بيوري لك توزيع الدخل على العالم كله علشان يخش بعد كده على الاربن والرولر انكواليتيز في بعض الدول وجوه الدوله الواحده الانتر انكواليتي وازاي بنقيس الويل بينج بتاع البني ادمين دي طبعا وي هاف سبنت ا هول لوت اوف تايم ستادي اباوت ذا هيومن ديفلوبمنت اندكس بعد كده السؤال اللي بيتجاب كل مره في كل كورس في ديفلوبمنت السؤال بتاع الكونفرجنس او الدايفرجنس هل في هل في ايفيدنس ان الدول او الكونفرجنس ولا هل هم بيبتعدوا عن بعض وان كانس تو انكم يعني هيومن ديفلوبمنت ان ايفيدنس لما هتخلص دي الاسئله اللي زمايلكم حاولوا يجاوبوا عليها او حطوها لما حطوا البرزنتيشن بتاعتهم ريفيو ديسكشن كويشنز لما تيجي تقرا كل ده اهدافك تطلع بايه؟ The poor countries have the chance to catch up with rich countries. If yes, what factors that qualify? ماش دي الأسئلة اللي بتقول ينفع ولا ما ينفعش وإيه هي الشروط اللي ممكن تخليه؟ إزاي أي دولة كان كان face an inequality gap between rural and urban areas اللي بتحصل عندها أو for that matter an inequality in women. المايجريشن من الرولر areas إزاي بتأثر على ال urban areas وبتأثر فيها في أي طريقة؟ Does the GDP per capita good measurement for well-being? طبعا انتوا عارفين ال other indices والكلام ده كله. Categorizing the countries high middle and low. هل ده representing the inequality و هل ده classification بيحط normal social differences؟ السؤال ده لطيف جدا لانه ذكي تمام يعني هل ال classification كويس ولا انت عايز classification احسن؟ هنا بقى الانكواليتي والايكوتي السؤال دوت يعني ايه عايز شويه بدايه هتحل الانكواليتي آه. انت عارف المشكله بتاعت الانكواليتي والراي بتاع ساكس وان الانكواليتيز ديت هتحقق نوع اكتر من العداله بس هل هتعمل ايه في الافشنسي الرولر والاربن ارياز طبعا مظاهر ال differences ما بينهم does poor countries according to the indices which measure well being making any progress to catch up with the rich countries by the question of divergence بس نتخيل بطريقة تانية measurements of income inequality دي دي بقى عايزة شوية تركيز لأن ده الجيني كوفيشنت والحتة بتاعته لازم يبقى الطالب اللي هنا فاهمها كويس أوي فاهم الجيني بيتكتب ازاي وعارف مصر فين ولاتين امريكا فين وامريكا فين واسكندنافيانز فين عشان تشوف بقى الناس اللي بتقول لك العداله وتتغير ازاي مع الوقت فدي حاجه من الحاجات اللي لازم تتابع دي الاسئله الحقيقه اللي زمايلكم لما قروا حطوها وذير فيريجنز نزلوا فيها وشغل كتير البرزنتيشن اللي اتعمل في الكلاس كان بتاع اميره وبتاع انجي ما ينفعش طبعا ان احنا نحط او نجيب سته تاني من غير ما نحط المقدمه الجديده يجب علينا أن نفصل بين أمرين، أولهما الطبقية المجتمعية، وثانيهما عدم المساواة. فالطبقية المجتمعية أمر محتوم بكل مجتمع، ولكن عدم المساواة يمكن أن تسلك عدة مسارات في العالم، بحقوقها اختلال في الحقوق البشرية، فمن أدهى صورها الجهل والعلم، الصحة والمرض، الحرب والسلم. عدم المساواة بين المرأة والرجل، فماذا لو أن علاج إحدى الأمراض يمكن أن يجد طريقا للخروج من عقل إحدى هؤلاء الأطفال إن تركوا تعليما كاملا ومستمرا حتى يصيروا أطباء أو باحثين، ولكن في نهاية المطاف جميع ما يوجد في الحياة يكمن في القلب المعنى الرقيم، وهل من أهدافنا وطموحاتنا أن ننتقل من عدم المساواة للتقييد أم ننتقل دعونا اليوم نستعرض ظاهرتين من ظواهر عدم المساواة في زحام ذلك العالم شكرا
بعد كده هم عملوا لنا برزنتيشن حلو قوي البرزنتيشن عندكم هتعدوا عليه حته حته وتشوفوا بيقول ايه في البرزنتيشن كان بيتكلم عن
كده عموما البرزنتيشن بتاعها داخل على الانكم بتاع حوالين العالم والسوشيال انكلوجن والتوزيع كل الناس تشوف الدنيا عامله ازاي بتتكلم عن تشوفوا بقى الويب سايتس نفسه وهو بيتكلم على الكونفرجنس والبرفيجنس وتقولوا ايه رايكم فيه 
We've been looking at the level of economic development across countries in the world. We've been using the shorthand of the gross domestic product per capita. One of the most important questions we want to know is whether today's poor countries have the chance and are indeed on a path to close the gap with the higher income countries. We know that if they make that transition successfully, it will raise their well-being, but it will also improve other aspects of life, the health, the life expectancy of the population, educational attainment, opportunities of the population more generally. We're interested, therefore, both in understanding whether poor countries tend to narrow the development gap with richer countries, and from that normative or goal-directed perspective, we're interested in how that can be achieved. Economists use a couple of terms that are very important uh, for this concept. Uh, the term convergence is the term uh, that is used to convey a narrowing of the proportionate gap uh, of uh, a poor country and uh, a richer uh, comparison country. Is the uh, proportion of income per person in the poor country relative to the rich country uh, rising? Uh, is the poor country closing that gap? If so, uh, the poor country is said to be converging with the higher income country. Uh, the opposite is divergence. Uh, divergence uh, means that the poor country in relative terms is becoming even poorer when compared to the rich country. Maybe the poor country is making progress. Maybe its income per person is rising 1% per year. But if the richer country is making even faster uh, economic growth, say 2% per year, then the poorer country will have a declining relative size uh, in gross domestic product per person relative to the higher income country. So we want to study whether countries are converging or diverging. That will tell us a lot about whether overall differences of material life, life expectancy, health, education levels, degree of urbanization, are tending to narrow between the rich and the poor countries or tending to widen. I would say in this very complicated question with a very diverse record of now the 193 countries around the world, so no one storyline that fits all, we could say in broad terms that one part of the period of modern economic growth has tended to be characterized by a kind of divergence, and more recently by a pattern of broad convergence. What do I mean by that? We're going to be studying how modern economic growth took off in the Industrial Revolution. And we know that until the Industrial Revolution began, most of the world was poor, most of the world was rural. The gaps of rich and poor countries were quite narrow, not like the huge gaps today. And then a takeoff started with the Industrial Revolution. And with that takeoff, a certain part of the world, a relatively small part of the world, starting in England, spreading to Great Britain more generally, spreading to Western Europe, the United States, Australia, a very few other places initially, experienced that industrialization in the first part of the 19th century. Most of the rest of the world remained poor and rural, and the overall process was one of divergence. The rich were becoming richer because they were industrializing. The poor were like they always were, uh, eking out a survival in uh, peasant farming in most of the world, relatively untouched by the new inventions of the steam engine or the railroad or the telegraph or the other technological advances that helped to set off the process of long-term economic growth. One could say that the rich were getting richer and the poor were kind of stuck at the bottom 
and the relative gap between the two was tending to widen. Then came a huge political phenomenon, and that is the phenomenon of imperialism. Because as Western Europe became industrial and quite powerful, it took political control over more and more of the world. Uh, we'll see that the British Empire spanned the world. We'll see that other European powers uh, took on more and more imperial possessions, notably in Africa and in Asia. This, I think, uh, was a, a big setback to the potential of convergence. Because when countries are dominated by other countries, it's very hard for those who are uh, in that uh, uh, subservient position politically to undertake the kinds of steps, uh, improving uh, the infrastructure of the country, uh, raising education levels that are crucial for achieving economic development. And often the imperial masters uh, are not so interested in the economic development uh, of their possessions. Uh, rather, they're interested in taking out as uh, many of the resources of those countries as they can for the development of their own home industries. I think it's fair to say that from the period of around 1850 to 1950, the world was broadly characterized by economic divergence where a few parts of the world were becoming richer and richer, more and more industrialized, more and more militarily powerful. Other parts of the world were stuck in poverty, and many parts of the world were stuck as the imperial possessions uh, of uh, European imperial powers. Of course, there was much history during that century and two devastating world wars. And at the end of the Second World War, uh, a quite different political dynamic, one very important for global economic development occurred, and that was the so-called uh, end of uh, the uh, colonial uh, era and the decolonization uh, of countries around the world who gained political independence. One of the bright spots of uh, political sovereignty, of freedom from imperial domination, was the ability of more and more countries to undertake economic development on their own. And many countries, when they got independent, said, hey, we're far behind. Now it's our turn to industrialize. We need to take crucial steps, build roads, build rail, uh, electrify uh, the country so that electrification provides a basis for industrial development. Uh, attract uh, industry, both the domestic uh, and foreign investors, so that we too can experience the process of economic development. And with that massive global political change and with further technological developments, better transport, better communications, the new information age, that enabled the poor countries of the world to pick up the pace of their economic development. And convergence, that is faster economic growth in the poorer countries, became more uh, of a usual condition than it had been in the years up to 1950. Since the middle of the last century, therefore, the end of World War II, the end of the imperial age, the beginning of economic development in many former colonies, we've seen a tendency towards convergence. And that is enabling more and more low-income countries to join the ranks of the middle-income countries and middle-income countries to join the ranks of the high-income countries. One of the crucial goals of sustainable development is that all of today's low-income countries, and especially the least developed countries, remember the 50 or so poorest and most vulnerable among the uh, low-income countries, should make that transition successfully through convergence to middle-income status. And most of them, or perhaps all, have the goal of achieving high-income status through 
their own economic development. One of our key goals is to understand how that process can work uh, and what is it that impedes convergence among some countries. When we look around the world today, we see ample evidence of uh, countries that were once poor achieving very rapid uh, convergence. China is our uh, most exemplary case, an astounding economic performance over uh, roughly 35 years since 1978 when China began many important economic reforms that put it on a path of convergent growth. We also see parts of the world, today's least developed countries, stuck in poverty. We'll call that a poverty trap that is so tight that they are not yet achieving economic convergence. Niger is an example of such a country. Uh, it is a landlocked country uh, in uh, the Sahel region of Africa. You can see on the map uh, that it is a country just south of the Sahara Desert. Uh, it's far from the coasts. It's uh, one of the world's poorest countries. It's a country that's just at the bottom of the world's human development index, meaning that not only is it income poor, uh, but also its conditions of education and health are very dire indeed. But not only has uh, Niger had to suffer this kind of poverty, it's been stuck in a poverty trap for a long period. So unlike China, it has not been achieving economic convergence. Let's look at the numbers uh, just uh, as an example. We'll measure the gross domestic product per person in purchasing power parity adjusted terms. Remember, taking into account difference of price levels across countries. If we look back in 1980, the per capita income in the prices of those days in the United States was about $12,000 per person. Uh, in China, about $250 per person, very poor. In Niger, uh, maybe even higher than China on the uh, official data at about $450 per person. Now let's fast forward to the year 2010. What's happened? Uh, China experienced a decade after decade of double-digit economic growth with the economy doubling every few years, every seven uh, years uh, on average. And that meant that by the time uh, 2010 uh, came around, China was no longer at $250 per person. It was now at nearly $10,000 per person. The United States uh, by then at about $50,000 per person. Niger, unfortunately, still stuck at below $1,000 per person and still among the least developed countries. If you ask the question about divergence and convergence, China went from being around 2% of the U.S. gross domestic product per person to being around 20% of the U.S. gross domestic product per person. Still far below the U.S. income level, even adjusting for price level, but narrowing the gap very quickly. Niger, sadly, started out at around 4% of the U.S. per capita level, but by 2010, less than 2%. In other words, experiencing divergence rather than convergence. One of our most important objectives in uh, the coming uh, talks will be to examine this process of convergence versus divergence to try to understand the underlying factors and really to unlock the keys that can help today's poorest countries get on a trajectory of convergence so that they too can have the improvements of material life, improvements of health, education, income per person that we know can be an important component of improved well-being.